Alright, I'm speaking with Greg Wilentz, the author of The Woman Who Fought an Empire, Sarah Aronson, and her Nilly Spiron. Thank you for speaking with me. Chris, it's a pleasure. So, I want to start by asking, um, when did you start writing history? Well, uh, if you define history as the criminal justice system in the 1970s, then I wrote a book about that topic uh, in the early 1980s, and most of the books I've written, one about the Dred Scott case, the Supreme Court case uh, that started the Civil War, and the State Department's response to the Holocaust, have all been history. Mm -hmm. Have you always wanted to write a book about this particular subject? Well, the last book, as I mentioned, had to do with the World War II and the Holocaust, and I became interested as a result of that in World War I, which in this country is practically forgotten. Mm -hmm. And the, so the topic of espionage uh, has always attracted me. I'm a former federal prosecutor. I've worked on cases involving the use of undercover techniques, which is somewhat similar. And I had an idea of perhaps writing about women or a woman spy in World War I. And that led me to this very remarkable woman, Sarah Harris. Tell me a little about the subject matter and focus of the book. Well, the setting of the book is principally World War I. And it's about this young woman. She was born in 1890 in Palestine, in what was then the Ottoman Empire, and is now Israel. Uh, her parents were from Romania. They emigrated in the early 1880s, mm -hmm. fleeing Pope and anti-Semitism and restrictions on Jewish economic activity. And they were among the first modern wave of settlers in Israel. They literally built a settlement on top of Mount Carmel in what is now northern Israel. And Sarah was born in 1890, one of six children. And she grew up in a little bit, I think, in a way that would have resembled the life of a pioneer child in the Old West or on the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. uh, the formal schooling ended at age 12. She learned to ride horses, shoot as well as men. She worked in the, in the fields. Uh, and at the same time, she was a highly intelligent, highly educated, and self-educated young woman. So, I get her parents. Did you? I didn't hear you mention what they did before they emigrated or or after they had emigrated. Well, they were uh, they they were part of a group of several hundred Romanians who left Romania and sailed uh, all the way to Palestine. And most of them, and this was true of the parents, had no agricultural skills, even though they were going to live from agricultural farming. And they were shopkeepers. They lived in the Romanian stunnels. Uh, they, they really didn't have the skills, and they barely made it uh, on this hilltop in Palestine, uh, but managed to kind of get a toehold, create a settlement. It's called Zikran Yaakov. Sarah grew up in that settlement. But the, the big change in her life occurred when, uh, before World War I began, which was in 1914, she married uh, a man who lived in Constantinople and moved to a businessman. Mm -hmm. And the war broke out a few months after she moved to Constantinople. This was now August of 1914. And she uh, grew homesick, probably because the war made it harder for her to get letters from her family, send letters to her family. And she grew homesick and decided to return home to his settlement, Zikron Yaakov, in Palestine, now Israel, uh, just for an extended visit to see her family and friends. She was very, very tied in with her family. And by virtue of a coincidence of geography and timing, her thousand-mile train trip home took her across what is now Turkey into the heart of the Armenian Genocide. The Armenian Genocide was conducted by the Ottoman Empire after it suffered setbacks at the beginning of World War I and became concerned that the two million Armenians living in the empire were a security threat, a fifth column, and in April of 1915 set in motion uh, a genocidal machinery that eliminated 
eliminated one and a half million, up to one and a half million of the Armenians and drove the rest out of the Ottoman Empire. And Sarah's train trip, ordinarily you'd be going through pastoral landscape, terraced hillsides, small farms, children running around in the villages, or going to school, and instead, for weeks, it took her weeks because she was often bucked from the train, mm -hmm. but the soldiers who were on the way to one front or another, now that the Ottoman Empire was in the war as a German ally, and this train trip took her through the worst kind of atrocities. She saw families struggling, beaten, staggering in the dust, dogs feeding on bodies. A train ran over a group of 50 or more Armenians who were sitting on the train tracks. She talked to, in the, and when she was put off the train and had to wait for another, she, she talked to women who had lost their husbands uh, for murder, uh, had been raped, their children had starved to death. And Sarah came away from this ordeal, and it may have left her with a, a kind of post-traumatic stress, came away convinced that the same thing would happen to the Jews in Palestine, another vulnerable minority, much smaller than the Armenian population. Mm. The same would happen to them unless Great Britain defeated the Ottoman Empire. And that's what led her to join a spy ring that had been started while she was in Constantinople by her brother, his name is Aaron, mm -hmm. and the young and Feinberg. So, apart from... Uh you know, the details of her story. Uh, is there a main theme you explore in the book? I would say the book is a kind of um, celebration of Sarah's courage and commitment. Because there were two shocks that led her to become the head of the spy. The first shock is the one I just described, the Armenian Genocide. Right. The son, when this young man, Afshan Feinberg, who she was very, very close to and had helped to start this firing, was killed in the desert trying to reach the British lines and offer the services of this firing to aid the British in their fight against the Ottoman Empire. That was devastating to her. She never got over it. But she decided to take his place as the leader of the firing and redeem his sacrifice by assisting the British in defeating the Ottoman Empire. And she did it under some of the most dangerous circumstances. She was operating behind enemy lines. There was no way, if she was cornered, shall we say, for her to get out of there. And that's eventually what happened to her. Mm -hmm. The British, once a month, would spend a spy, send a spy ship to pick up her intelligence. But she was on her own in enemy territory running a spy ring, and the spy ring was mostly young male Jews and a fairly unruly group. And just to complicate her management of the spy ring, several of them were in love with her. She was now 27 years old. Yeah. And, and she was absolutely committed to what she was doing. She almost viewed it as a sacred duty because of the death of this young man whom she deeply cared for and was absolutely fearless. In fact, her brother, who would help to start the spire, as I said, his name is Aaron. Aaron is now in Cairo, working with British intelligence. He is sort of the British liaison through the spy ship to the newly spire, in effect, to his own system. Mm -hmm. And he pleaded with her about the letters, and at one point she made a visit on the spy ship to Cairo. And he pleaded with her to stay in Cairo, that she was too risky, it was too dangerous mm -hmm. for her to go back, and she was adamant. And she just absolutely refused to listen to him. She earned the admiration of the British intelligence uh, officers. They were uh, they were almost starstruck. Uh -huh. young, called her, they called her Aaron's plucky sister, but they were almost starstruck by her. The day that she left to return to Palestine, one of these uh, these British intelligence officers made a special paid a special visit to her hotel in Cairo to offer his respects. And and mind you, this is at a time 
We're now in 1917. This is at a time when courage is not in shortage in the British Army. Right. British soldiers are being cut down in Europe in the trench warfare like skies wheat. They're being asphyxiated by poison gas attacks. Uh, they're, they're dying in the droves. And, and he felt, this British intelligence officer felt that nonetheless, Sarah was taking risks that were extreme, even by British standards. And in fact, he proved to be right. So was, was that the only Palestinian spy ring um, that the British were dealing with, or were there any others? They used Arab agents, not so much rings, but agents who they recruited. Hmm. But they found none of them terribly satisfactory. At some point, they, they gave thought to just wrapping up, sort of disbanding all of the spies who were working for them, except for the Nili Ring. And the Nili Ring, under Sarah's leadership, has come to be regarded as the most effective spy ring in the Middle East theater, and it could have been one of the most effective spy rings in the, uh, in the entire war. And she had, Sarah had, a network of some two to three dozen spies throughout Palestine and as far away as Damascus. Many of them she had recruited. Some of them were actually serving, uh, Jewish men who were serving in the Turkish army mm. and were in a position to steal maps, to provide information about Turkish uh, dispositions, fortifications, troop strength. And one of her most important intelligence coups was one of her agents at a, at a very critical rail line junction reported to her on new airplanes that were being sent by the Ottomans, the Turks, I'll call them occasionally, uh, south to the front, uh, which was now uh, in the Sinai Desert. And her report on the flying and machine gun firing characteristics of these planes uh, caused the British to realize that they were in very imminent danger of losing air superiority in the Sinai Desert. Hmm. And I've got the documents, the daily British intelligence summaries, that without using Sarah's name, describe her reports. And one of them, the next day, after it was recorded, this report about the airplanes, the head of the British forces in Egypt uh, sent an urgent telegram to the British War Office pleading for advanced airplanes from Britain, lest he lose air superiority. And that air superiority, which is restored in time hmm. for one of the most important battles in the Middle East, the Third Battle of Gaza, mm -hmm. fought in November 1917, and that battle, the British had lost the first two. That's why there was a third battle. <laughs> battle, which was to, was for the, really to, to breach the gateway, the narrow gateway that the British had to go through to get into Palestine. The British won, and their forces moved into Palestine, and within weeks, they had captured Jerusalem, and the whole course of the war, uh, in the Middle East, went downhill from the, for the Ottomans, and about a year later, they signed an armistice, which was a tantamount to a surrender, and that was the end of the Ottoman Empire. So how did uh, her spies who were in the uh, Ottoman army, how did they get their information back to her? She made trips through the countryside with one of her spies in a carriage, a horse-drawn carriage. Uh, wearing a, a white blouse and a long skirt, just a young woman on a pleasant drive through the countryside. Hmm. And she arranged clandestine meetings with them. She found ways to get word to them. And no one suspected her. She did not look like a spy. Now, she's a very, uh, I think, attractive, very beautiful woman, blue eyes, blondish hair, kind of an upward tilt of her head, a very independent uh, attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, but no one suspected her of a spy, of being a spy, and no one realized that she was running spy ring until uh, an event that uh, happened out of her control. And here's what happened. Uh, as I mentioned, this young man was killed uh, in the desert. Mm -hmm. But only Sarah and her brother 
knew that this had happened. And they decided not to reveal the fact that this young man had died in the desert to the other spies in the Middle East spy ring. They were concerned because he was such a charismatic figure, so dashing, so fearless. He inspired everybody that if they learned he was dead, that that would destroy them or how it might destroy the effectiveness of the Middle East spy ring. So she made up a story. She could be cold blooded in this way. That he was actually now he'd gone across the desert and contacted the British and was now in England training to be a pilot. Mm -hmm. It wasn't for that. But uh, she told this to her spies. And there was one young man in particular, his name is Naman Belkin, who didn't believe her. And he decided he was going to go to Cairo and see this Absalom Feinberg and make certain he was alive. Mm -hmm. And he set off across the Sinai Desert. He was caught by the Turks. They suspected him. I was a young Jewish man in the Sinai Desert heading for Egypt. They suspected him of being a spy. They tortured him relentlessly. And finally he broke and he gave them information that allowed the Turks to catch Sarah and a number of her other spies. And this was on which, was the date of that, that she was captured? She was captured in early October 1917. Okay. And this is the part of her story for which she's best known in Israel. Her story isn't that well known in the United States. But she was tortured by the Turks for four days. And the Turks were masters of torture. It was practically a, a standard police procedure, but they had perfected for that, but they had perfected their skills during the Armenian genocide. Mm -hmm. And she held up. She refused to give them any information. In fact, she taunted them. You think because I am a woman, I will be weak. I have dug you a grave. I have made it possible for the British to bury you. In fact, it infuriated the Turks, uh, and they, they tortured her even more. But by the fourth day, she didn't think she could hold that anymore. She was at the limit of her strength, and she even wrote a note for others to be found when the Turks had left her alone in the house they were using for this torture chamber, mm -hmm. and made it clear that she wanted to be remembered as a warrior who fought for her people, uh, and had not surrendered. The next day, she was allowed to go back, because this all took place in the town that she grew up in. Yeah. And she was allowed to go back to her family home to change her dress. And then she was going to be taken to Nazareth for torture by even more advanced techniques, and then go to Damascus to be hung. And the Turks let her go into the house. They put up a guard around the house so that she couldn't escape. And she had hidden the pistol in the house just for this occasion. Yeah. And she shot herself in the bathroom of the house. And even then, she didn't die. The bullet paralyzed her. She shot herself in the mouth. And she lived in agony for another four days until finally, on October 9, 1917, she died. Hmm. Uh, she's now remembered as the Jewish Joan of Arc. And she's a major figure in Israel. In fact, the, the family home where she shot herself has been turned into a museum. And every year, 30,000 Israeli school children visit this museum. And it would be the equivalent in this country of a million school children visits every year mm -hmm. to a place like this. So, it sounds, uh, I'm curious about the environment of her village and where she was, um, you know, doing her, her espionage activities. You know, was there, she, was she supported by the local population or, you know, and I imagine there was a, a, an Ottoman garrison there, you know, this police garrison at the minimum. Uh, the answer is she was not, by and large, supported by her fellow Jews in Palestine. They were fearful, the ones who knew about her activities, were terrified that if 
and when the Turks found out, and eventually did, uh, that there would be enormous retaliation and vengeance on the Jewish community as a whole. Mm -hmm. And some of the leading figures in the Jewish community pleaded with her to discontinue her spying activities. And she refused. She was so convinced and so committed to what she was doing, to the belief that a British victory would be the salvation of the Jewish people, uh, that she absolutely refused and continued anyway. And just to stop for a moment, let's stand back and look at historically. Historically, she was right. The mm. British victory led to the British occupation of Palestine, Palestine mandate under British rule, the Balfour Declaration, which promised the Jewish people a homeland in Palestine, and eventually the Jewish state. And that's one of the reasons that she's today a revered figure in, in Israel. But at the time, she was regarded as a rebel and reckless and, and irresponsible, but she persisted anyway. Now, in terms of the environment that she was operating in, uh, at that time, there were perhaps 80,000 Jews all told in, in Israel. Uh, it was a, um, it was perhaps, uh, I might describe it as a, a agriculturally fertile land in many places, but also, even by American standards of the day, a, a primitive place. Most of the, uh, the time when you got around, it wasn't even by, by car or train, it was by horse-drawn carriage. Mm. You know, horses was a principal means of, of communication between the settlements. Mm -hmm. And uh, agricultural was the, the principal mainstay of the community. There wasn't significant manufacturing. And the war was very hard on the Jewish community because the, the Ottomans appropriated Jewish farming equipment, mm -hmm. Jewish farms, all the way to the barbed wire and the machinery uh, to use for the, for the war effort. So that the Jewish community was, was suffering greatly during this period. So was there, so in these areas, was there Ottoman brutality towards Jews or towards local Arabs, or was it sort of a, a calm situation where people didn't want the kind of trouble, you know, di didn't sympathize with her fears that there would be, you know, this large amount of persecution? Uh, there was brutality. Uh, there was one incident I describe in the book where uh, young men from a village were rounded up and taken away because of a, a report totally unfounded that the village had supplied wheat to the British, and ultimately their lives were spared. But I think it's it's fair to say that for the most part, Jews sort of just hit their head down. I think there's a perhaps a, a belief that in these kinds of times, that the best thing the Jews can do is is ride out the storm, not uh, take sides in a conflict like this. And eventually they'll survive, and, and indeed that's how Jews kept their their traditions, their religious practices and beliefs intact for two millennia. And I think Sarah's vision was different. Mm -hmm. She had a sense of her vulnerability. And ultimately, I think when you look at what happened in World War II, I think her sense of history, and where history was taken the Jews, turned out to be much more accurate. Than those of her co-religionists in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Now, the community in which she was living was that made up mostly of um, Jews from Romania or or Europe or you know what was the sort of that mix? Uh, well, the, the community was called Zichron Yaakov, and as I said, it was on top of Mount Carmel, which is actually a series of peaks south of Haifa. It's now Haifa, and um, it, it was founded initially by Romanian Jews. But Jews from Russia and other parts of Eastern Europe uh, also settled there. By the out outbreak of World War One, it was perhaps a thousand people living there, and it was quite then before the war. It was quite a, a prosperous community. It was even uh, had a certain uh, sort of charm. Uh, French culture was very much in vogue. French fashion, science, uh, literature. Uh, and and it became known as Little Paris. But then the war came, and and times got much harder. Well, I, it's it's telling that 
Um, I guess at this point, you know, after, it seems after a few decades, maybe everyone felt, you know, more tied as, as Jews who lived in this area. But considering the fact it was made up of slightly different groups, it seemed that being Jewish kept her safe in a sense, if you follow what I'm saying. You know, it sounds like no one, even though they weren't comfortable with what she was doing, no one reported her. That's know. right. There was a threat, a veiled threat made in a meeting between Sarah and these Jewish leaders who were now very angry at her. This is a, a young woman who had grown up with them. They'd seen known her since she was a child. Mm -hmm. That in front of them, mostly middle-aged or older men, and they were they were very angry. They felt that she was endangering the community. But they never, they were not the ones who turned the Nilly Spine. It was this accident, if you will, with the Van Ammon Balkan. Right. They, they said, if you keep doing this, then the conflict between us could break out in the open and the Turks may learn of it. But ultimately, they did not report her to the Turkish authorities. Not, I, I, if, I'm sorry if you already mentioned this, but how, how religious was she? Uh, she was observant in the sense that she would observe Jewish holidays like Passover uh, and, and prayed. I don't have much information about her family's religious practices in the sense where they were they regularly going to a synagogue. Uh, I, I don't have that kind of information, but I had the sense that they were... <laughs> very aware of their religious uh, context, mm -hmm. aware of themselves as Jews, uh, and very much committed to preserving Jewish traditions. Did you get a sense the rest of the community was sort of at that level, or was it perhaps more liberal or more orthodox, or, you know? I, I, I had a sense that they were more or less small at that level, with some variation, some who were less devout and others who were more devout. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, I did not come across that much that much information. Okay. So uh, that leads me to the, to ask, um, what resources did you use to do your research? Well, uh, I started working on the book at the beginning of 2016. And I made a trip to Israel to go to the museum that I, I mentioned earlier, what was formerly her family home. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't expecting this, but it turned out that over the years, ever since Sarah's death, first her sister, and then uh, museum archivists had gone around, not just in Palestine, later Israel, but even in the United States and Europe, to find correspondence, documents. Her letters that she wrote from when she was in Constantinople, uh, letters her brother wrote when he was in Cairo, and there was an extraordinary archive there. And I had to ultimately hire multiple translators to translate what was an older form of Hebrew. It wasn't easy kind of Hebrew that is not apparently in style anymore, not used anymore. Huh. And that's what I built the book around. I, I thought that Sarah and her fellow spies and her family uh, could speak better for themselves than I ever. And so I have used those letters to construct the narrative of uh, Sarah Aronson and her spy ring. Did you uh, consult with any secondary, secondary sources or you know museum curators or, or historians? Yes, I, I spoke to several Israeli historians, and I did rely on books that had been written about, although interestingly enough, not so much her, she's been the, been the topic, you know, subject in books, but her brother, her brother Aaron, who was in Cairo during the war. Uh, and Aaron was a famous uh, agronomist in Palestine. He discovered a form of wheat before the war again. He discovered a form of wheat that had been thought extinct. And in a world that was largely agrarian, uh, it was a sensation. He was 39 and became an international celebrity. He was even invited to the United States to lecture and consult with scientists who were interested in whether his discovery could help agriculture in the dry western plains. Hmm. 
and while he was there, he met with some of the most prominent Jews in America and raised $20,000, which was a lot then, to build on the Mediterranean, Mediterranean coast of Palestine a agricultural research facility where he produced wheat and other grains at a much greater a much greater volume than other farms in Palestine were doing, even though he'd chosen a comparatively arid location to conduct his experiments in agronomy. And that agricultural station, which is a sort of a big building with a laboratory and a library and, and lots of fields, that was about a mile from the Mediterranean, and that became a headquarters for the Nili spy room. And when the British ship came to pick up the Nili intelligence reports that I mentioned just a, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, that's where it came. And the spies would go from the agricultural station down to the beach. The spy ship would put a, kind of a surf boat into the water that was rowed to the shore. And then they would hand over their intelligence reports and get back letters from Charlie's brother Aaron asking for you know, to, where are the bridges being built in the bridges, what's the gauge on the railroad tracks, so the Turkish forces had flamethrowers, all kinds of military uh, intelligence and information. And those rendezvous were the key events for these spots because it was their one contact, they're getting behind enemy lines. Uh, there's constant anxiety and tension, and these rendezvous at the beach were critical to their morale. It's when they could talk to British sailors, exchange greetings, they often were food packets, they were included in the supplies that the British sailors handed over to the noise bars. And there were probably at the time that Sarah was running this firing, perhaps one per month. Hmm. Did you come across any interesting artifacts or objects related to this? Well, I think the really interesting artifact, if you will, is the Aronson family home. Because, hmm. uh, it, it, you know, some of the espionage was conducted at this agricultural facility, but they also used the Aronson family home in Zikron Yaakov, about 10 miles away, for espionage purposes. And they actually had dug uh, under the home an escape tunnel so that if the home were ever raided, whoever was in it could get out the, uh, the escape pipe. Mm. Sarah created a kind of a cubby hole in a door frame where she hid the gun that she later used to, to shoot herself and take her own life. And that is now one of the main attractions. You know, there's the spy, the, the spy facilities in the spy paraphernalia is now one of the main attractions for these school kids who come to visit it. And they're, they crawl down into this escape room. Uh, the basement, for example, had been widened out uh, and, and used, and they buried in the basement floor some of the intelligence reports before they would dig it up and then take it to the rendezvous with the British spy ship. So that, to me, was the most interesting part of it. And it's there Today, I found it fascinating. Uh, I spent a couple of days there, uh, and I would hope anyone uh, who's ever in Israel goes to Zikron Yaakov and visits the Aronson Museum. So why why didn't she use the ex escape tunnel when they let her um, in her home? Because by then, a, a huge Turkish force had surrounded Zikron Yaakov. Hmm. They had set up two perimeter rings both of which she would have had to get through even after she got out of the escape tunnel. And they had a ring of soldiers around the house before they would let her into the house. So she knew that she was not going to escape. And, and, and if she tried, that was if she tried to escape, she'd end up being captured by the Turks. And this might be her only opportunity to use the gun that she had left uh, if it was needed in this kind of circumstance. So had the, had the troops surrounded the uh, community because of her activities? Were they trying to keep any any other spies from escaping? Or... Yes, that was the purpose. In other words, this, I mentioned this young man who had gone across the desert 
find his friend Ashalom Feinberg, who was captured by the Turks, and when he was tortured, he gave up the, the, the identity of the, of the spies, including Sarah's name, and told the Turks where they could find them. In this case, it was Zikran Yaakov. Hmm. And that's where they happened to be at that point. And so when the Turks came in, they came in with uh, soldiers, armored vehicles, and surrounded it. And when Sarah refused to give them any information, these Turks gathered the townspeople in a, in a building and said, in effect, if you don't find a spy who will give us the information we want, because they were still looking for several spies who had escaped before the Turks arrived, mm. then we're going to destroy this town. And they became absolutely hysterical. They vowed to find uh, this a spy, there was a particular spy they were looking for, uh, who had escaped. Uh, they ultimately didn't succeed, but they were terrified that they would, um, they would be, uh, their town would be destroyed, their homes would be destroyed. And I mentioned that Sarah was taken to her family home uh, so she could change her clothing bloodstone in order to, and before she was then taken to Nazareth mm -hmm. for more torture. And so she was led along the main street of this village, this town, and most of the townspeople had shuttered their windows. They had been listening, mind you, for days to screams coming from this house that was used as a torture chamber, not just on Sarah, but others who the Turks thought had information. And so they just shut their windows and stayed in the darkness. But several came out onto the street and cursed Sarah and threw stones at her. And I, I've always been struck by that image of this young woman, her hands tied in front of her, being led by a rope, surrounded by Turkish guards, through a town she had grown up in, and where the townspeople were throwing stones at her. And what we know of that incident, she never blinked, she held her head high, she walked to the entrance to her home, rope was untied, she looked around, she went inside, and then we know what happened after that. Hmm. So, was it men and women throwing stones and, and jeering at her, or is any idea? The recollection of one of the witnesses was it was women. Women. I wouldn't rule out, I wouldn't rule out that men were involved, but it was women. In fact, the women, there were some women who were... Uh, uh, apparently, you know, not, went to the Turks and said, you should search that house again. You'll find something there. Turned out she was wrong. Hmm. And in the note that Sarah wrote the day, the night before she was taken back to her house, uh, to change her clothes and where she shot herself, in that note she left, it was found some weeks later, uh, she mentioned several of the women's names because she heard her Turkish tormentors mentioning the names, not realizing that Sarah at that point where the Sarah spoke Turkish. Huh. And and there's a, a legend, there are a lot of legends that have grown up around the Nili Spire. But one of them is that uh Nili spies who survived all this after the war ended went back and killed one or more of these women who had tried to give information to the Turks out of, out of vengeance. I don't know, I haven't seen, I should say, I haven't seen any evidence that supports mm -hmm. but one of these sort of the lore that mm -hmm. grows up around, I think it grows up around an event like that. And I guess, do people who hear this lore generally are supportive of that vengeance? Like, whether it happened or not, people seem positively inclined towards that? Well, I, I I don't think I can really say that anybody was, I came across any evidence that anyone was really that kind of bloody monitor, but the interesting thing that happened was that for years after the war, even after the British occupation, which was much easier on the Jews than in Palestine, than the Turkish occupation had been, uh, the Nili spies who survived were, as, as one as one person put it, among the loneliest people in Palestine. They mm -hmm. would walk down the street and they'd hear mutter, spy, 
uh, they were told, some people told them, you've got to get and leave. We don't want you here. And, and Sarah was, was reviled as well, dead, but, but, you know, not, not a, not a heroine by any means to the Jewish community in the years after World War I in Palestine. And then gradually, the bitterness faded, and it was replaced by a new narrative. And the narrative was Sarah, as a woman who had given up, you know, sort of the things that women do, a family, uh, and comforts, to become a leader of her people. And that kind of became an overdeputization in itself. Uh, she was really a woman, and and not a a saint in the way they were portraying her, not quite in those terms. Right. But starting in 1932, uh, uh, pilgrimages began taking place in her hometown, and and within a few years, there were thousands of people every year on the day of her death who would make a pilgrimage and their pictures of them just filling the streets and they would go from the house where she was tortured down that main street the same walk that she took with the women in the village throwing stones at her and cursing her and thousands of people would make their way down that main street to the family home where she shot herself and then there was an event that took place in 1967 that sort of officially granted her status as a heroine of the state of Israel. That year, a Israeli policeman was convinced that he could find, had, had, there was an Israeli policeman in 1967 for a long time thought he could find the grave of Ashlam Feinberg, this young man whom Sarah was so close to, who died in the Sinai Desert. And he felt that his, he had good relations, kind of a student of the Bedouin, good relations with the Bedouin tribes in the area of the Sinai Desert where Feinberg had been killed. And his body had never been found. And until 1967, he couldn't do anything to investigate where Feinberg was buried. Mm -hmm. 1967, the Six Day War, Israel captures the Sinai Desert. Mm -hmm. And this policeman, this student of the Bedouin, you know, buys Bedouin tribes, talks to them, he's sort of passed off from one to another, and finally someone says, we know where he's buried. It's the Jew's grave. He'll find it, and he'll give him a particular location, and it's under a large date palm tree, the grave. So the policeman goes with the veteran friends to this location, where there is a large date palm tree growing out of the desert, and they start digging. And they start to come upon bones, shoulder bones, a pelvis, and they unearth a skeleton. And with the aid of an Israeli forensic laboratory in Tel Aviv and information they had from Ashlaf Feinberg's the young man who they had just discovered sister about a crack tooth that he had, mm -hmm. they confirmed that in fact this was Ashlaf Feinberg. Mm -hmm. And the theory was that the date tree had grown from dates that Ashlam had been carrying in his pocket hmm. when he crossed the Sinai Desert. And just to give you a little bit of Millie lore, if you will, that I was not able to verify, but it's a wonderful story. The lore is that before, before he set out on his desert crossing, Sarah had given him dates. His dates are the desert travelers' sustenance provisions. Right. Those are the dates. It turned into this giant date palm tree 50 years later. And his, this discovery had a remarkable impact on Israel. And Absalom was given a full military funeral on Mount Herzl, which is roughly the equivalent of our Washington, Arlington National Cemetery. Hmm. His, his casket was surrounded by soldiers who stood guard from the Israeli Defense Forces. Thousands filed by 
and the Speaker of the Israeli Knesset, the Parliament, made a speech in which he asked the forgiveness of Absalom and the other Hilly spies for the tragic misunderstanding and the failure to recognize their great achievements. Mm -hmm. That year was the first year that, that Sarah's, the Israeli government, held a formal ceremony at Sarah's grave, which is in Zikran Yaakov. Huh. And that was the beginning of her sort of absorption into the mainstream, you know, heroines of heroes and heroines of, of Israel, which is the, the position she has today. And I visited Matt Herzl when I was there, and I went to Absalom's grave with the assistance of a, uh, of a, of a, of a, of a guide there. And they had, they, what I read was that they had transplanted the palm tree to his grave on Mount Herzl. And indeed, there was a palm tree still there, a big palm. Hmm. I don't know if it was the same, no one could tell me that, right. with a replacement. So, while well, her story is a tragic one, it's heartbreaking. In the end, I found that the discovery of Absalom Feinberg's remains and her becoming this patron hero of the Jewish state gave it a, a kind of a, an uplifting ending and a, and a kind of a meaning and a, and a, a moving a coda uh, that I found very great. Yeah. So of all the things you mentioned or maybe didn't mention, uh, what part of the research was the most enjoyable? It was getting the translated letters from my, my translators, which didn't come in all at once. They would, I said, send it to me as you get to translate it. So I could read them in English. And all, and reading these letters, all of a sudden, Sarah Aronson became alive for me. Hmm. That was the most gratifying. What did you find out that was most surprising? Uh, I, I think, uh, I had fully appreciated how, I'm, I'm not even certain I can explain it totally, but this remarkable transition of this young woman, uh, a year before she was running the spire, she'd been a housewife in Constantinople. She only had a formal education up to the age of 12. Now, she was very educated, very intelligent. She had no military background. She had no espionage experience, no espionage training. And somehow, partly because of those two shocks I told you about, mm -hmm. and partly because I think she was a, a very strong little person, very bold and daring, which you need if you're going to be a spy, uh, and partly her intelligence, she turned out to be a highly effective leader of an espionage training. And that, to me, was the most surprising if something like that could could happen, because I really didn't know much about how she ran the ring until I got these letters. So the letters that she exchanged between her and her brother, and the decisions she had to make on a day to day basis, uh, and that's that was what really struck me. Still does stagger. So, what was the most difficult point uh, or fact or? Uh, what was the most difficult part to research that you were able to maybe finally come to re reach a conclusion or maybe didn't even uh, reach a conclusion that's still a mystery? Well, there were certain events that were very important. For example, how did Sarah learn of Absalom's death? And what was her reaction that I really wanted to, to explain, but it was very difficult and I had to work with several different documents, letters she wrote, letters her brother wrote, and recollections of sort of oral history that was taken from her spies and the spouses of some of her spies. And putting it together was was a real challenge. The other challenge, um, and I'm really leaving it to the reader to decide, is her relationship with Absalom Fonda, the young man who died in the desert. Uh, some books which have discussed the Millie Spiring and Absalom have suggested that they had a full out, you know, romance and relationship. I don't know. I went back and forth. There's no conclusive evidence. Uh, he was engaged before the war to Sarah's sister. 
and she was absolutely loyal to her sister. On the other hand, at a certain point during the war, when Absalom was still alive and Sarah and he were involved in the spiral, Sarah's sister had gone to the United States, so they were, for the first time in their lives, without without Sarah's sister. It was wartime, that there was danger, they became close, they were young. I don't know. Mm. I do know this, that there was a bond between Sarah, her sister, and this young man, Absalom Feinberg, that was strong, ties of loyalty and devotion that I found enviable, even if there wasn't a romance as we would conceive it, there was still a strong love between all three of them. Mm -hmm. And why, romance or not, his death was so devastating to her. She never got over it. It comes up in her letters that she wrote to her brother and to others after his death when she was running the spiral. So you mentioned many things that were pretty emotional. Was there anything specific that when you discovered you had, you literally had an emotional reaction then and there? You know, did anything just grip you that strongly? Um, I think there were some moments in some of her letters when I was reading them for the first time. And she, she had been um, deceiving. Absalom Feinberg's family lying to them that uh, he was still alive. And in a letter to her brother, she wrote that she was dreading the day when they learned the truth. And what she was, and she even kind of had a line in there about what she was going to say to them. And you could sense her own grief coming through it. And it was more of a kind of you know, yes, it was terrible. What can we say? If we'd been alive, things would have been, been different. And you sensed her own grief in the restrained way in which she planned to speak to the family. But then she, she ended it. But I would rather be on the other side of the earth. I don't have the strength for that. Mm. Meaning she did not have the strength, and this is a strong woman, to confront the grieving family of Absalom Feinberg, who she lied to. And then have to deal at the same time with her own group. Mm. And that was a point to pick up. So what do you hope this book will do, uh, in the, you know, in, for military history, espionage history, Jewish history, you know? Well, a couple of things. I, I, first of all, I hope I'll succeed in making Sarah accessible to American readers. Because her story is, is truly inspirational. The second thing is, um, I hope it rebuts, perhaps puts an end to, uh, the Hollywood myth of women spots, which is along the lines of the femme fatale cultural stereotype. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, an article, a cover story in Newsweek two years ago about women in the CIA, and part of it dealt with the frustration CIA women who do actual jobs and take real risks have with how women spies are portrayed in movies and on cable TV shows. And I thought it characterized that cultural image very nicely. And it was Hollywood sees women spies as badass bitches who stab by day and seduce by night. Mm -hmm. And it's a terribly unfair stereotype. And Sarah's story, to me, is the kid. Can you speak to any difficulties you had in getting the book published and how you overcame those? Well, I'll say this. At the outset, I was working and with an agent on a book about three World War I spies. One of whom was Sarah. The other two were spies in Europe. And that was difficult to get traction with because I really couldn't connect them their paths never crossed. And, but once we narrowed it down to Sarah, then, you know, the publisher fell in, the publisher fell in place. So what's your next writing project? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> I'm, 
I'm taking a break. Okay. So where can uh, people find your, your current works, your past works? Well, uh, the book is in Amazon and in bookstores, and any bookstore can order it if it doesn't have a copy. It's going to be formally released on March 1. Uh, if you go to uh, Goodreads, which is sort of an Amazon uh, sort of uh, co uh, entity that uh, publishes, you know, promotes books and has a lot of information about books, uh, you'll find our my name, you'll find the other three books I've written. Uh, I also have a website and even readings, that is recorded readings from Sarah's letters, mm -hmm. and it's www.gregorywallace.com and you'll get a lot of information about Sarah and my other books. Okay. Um, any final thoughts? That's all the questions I have. Chris, no. Uh, this has been wonderful. You've asked a, a lot of great questions and you've, you've allowed me to talk a lot about the feelings I had uh, when I was writing this book, which was a very, very gratifying experience. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It was a yeah, very interesting conversation. Thank you for listening. More information can be found at warscholar.org.